The business of teaching is tough. Whether you're homeschooling or whether you're working in a classroom, it can be very tiring. So I always look at humor as a mini vacation. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Director of Marketing. Our goal here is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So, Andrew, last week, we kind of left our listeners with a bit of a cliffhanger in that we started talking about the benefits of humor in teaching and speaking, and then you started to talk about the reasons why things are funny, and you started with the first one, which is? Misunderstandings. Like the little boy who said, so which one was Jesus' mother, the Virgin Mary or the King James Virgin? (laughs) <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I think my wife, and I bet we all have experience mm-hmm. like this. I think she, for many years as a young child, truly believed that the name of God was art. 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 Our Father, who art in heaven. <laughs> right, right. No, she told me that. <laughs> right. But we all have those little things, you sure. know, that we misunderstand as a child. So it's a good thing we're picking this back up, though, Mm -hmm. because, you know, seven days without a good laugh makes one week. Yes, it does. (laughs) And we don't want anyone getting weak. No. (laughs) (laughs) Some people might scowl at a pun like that. (laughs) But, you know, the business of teaching is tough. Whether you're homeschooling or whether you're working in a classroom, it can be very tiring, especially around this time of year when you just think, oh, Would the sun just come out? Would the school year just be Mm -hmm, over? Could mm -hmm. we just relax a little bit? Right. So I always look at humor as a mini vacation. Nice. Right? I like that. You get a, 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 you know, people do power naps. (laughs) Yes. Right? (laughs) You can do a power nap 20 minutes on the sofa, right? Right. And you're good to go for the rest of the day. So a good joke, it's like a, a mini vacation, right? Power, power nap type. So there's misunderstandings. Another type of that would be uh, one of my favorite jokes. The Pope comes to Minneapolis, pick your city, okay. for the North American Catholic Congress of Bishops or something. He gets in the limousine, they drive down the road, and he says to the chauffeur, you know, could I drive a little bit? The chauffeur's kind of taken back. Well, no, I'm, you're the Pope. I'm the chauffeur. Mm-hmm. I really should drive. And the Pope says, hey, never let me drive in the Vatican. And I've always wanted to drive on these nice wide roads and in America, and this could be my only chance. If you just let me drive a little, I'd be so grateful. And he kind of works on and works on. Finally, the chauffeur gives in, pulls over, and Pope gets out the back, gets in the front, takes off down the road. And it isn't but just a few minutes until the Pope's excellent driving skills attract the attention of a police officer who (laughs) flashes his lights. So police officer pulls him over, comes up, Pope rolls down the window, cop looks in the window and sees the Pope. And he says, uh... Wait just a minute. And he goes back and he says, quick, quick, give me the chief. Chief, I've pulled over a VIP, a big one. Chief says, well, who, the mayor or something? No, no, chief, bigger than the mayor. He goes, well, it's bigger than the mayor. The governor's not tooling around in his Porsche again. No, no, it's bigger than the governor. Bigger than the governor? There's one bigger than the governor. I mean, if the vice president was around, it'd be Secret Service all over the place. No, chief, bigger than the vice president. Chief finally says, well, would you just shut up and tell me who's in the car? (laughs) Cop says, Chief, I don't know who's in the car, but his chauffeur is the Pope. (laughs) Kind of another level of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. The thing about the elements of humor, and if we go over these remaining 11, it's important to realize that a, a very good humorous situation, a very good joke or story will often combine more than one of these elements. So while we try to analyze them and say that's the dominant 
type of humor in this particular joke or or situation. A a well constructed joke has multiple layers. Sure. Yep. Just like a book. A book can have kind of a dominant genre, you know, it's a whole story, but there's broken bits, or it's a broken story, but there's healing bits. So we can have this mixing of types. And that's that's what really like cooking makes for the better recipe. So second thing I came up with here is the impossible absurdity, right? It creates this image that's just so crazy that its very existence conflicts with possibility and therefore there's that tension, right? There's always a tension in humor. So I once heard a a comedian say this little line. He said, my friend had a pet elephant. He lost it in his apartment. (laughs) So it it increasingly becomes absurd. Okay, no one has a pet elephant. (laughs) Furthermore, how could you lose one? Right. (laughs) Furthermore, in your apartment. You can't even get the elephant in the apartment. So it, Mm -hmm. it amplifies the absurdity. At a young age, one of my son's favorite poems, as well as one of my favorite poems at a young age, was The Little Old Man of the Sea. Mm. Little Old Man of the Sea went out in a boat for a sail. The water came in almost up to his chin. He had nothing with which to bail. So this Little Old Man of the Sea, he drew out his jackknife so stout, and a hole with its blade in the bottom he made so that all of the water ran out. Well, you can't... (laughs) drain the water from your boat by cutting a hole in the bottom. (laughs) But you say it in such a way that, oh, it's just a matter of fact. So you Mm -hmm. have these impossible absurdities, right? Good. So that would be the second example. A third, and I don't think these are hierarchical. I don't think we're getting Mm -hmm. higher up in quality of humor or effectiveness. It's just different types mixed together. You are, I believe, familiar with one of my favorite writers, G.K. Chesterton. Yes. Whose humor was always very subtle, very subtle. And a lot of it had to do with explaining things by stating the obvious, but in an unexpected way, Mm -hmm. right? So when you state the obvious, but it kind of catches people by surprise, it has a little bit of, of humor, his book, The Napoleon of Notting Hill, okay, right. starts out with this first part of a sentence. The human race, to which so many of my readers belong, has been playing at children's games from the beginning. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> duh. <laughs> so why is that funny? There, there's that the human race to which so many of my readers belong. So maybe some of his readers are chimps? I don't know. Yeah, or it makes you, you know, (laughs) contemplate whether you're part of that or not. I don't know. Another variation on this would be this statement. I expected to enjoy the film, but that was before I saw it. Okay. (laughs) Obviously, you expected before you saw it. Right. (laughs) But you're stating, you know, you're stating kind of the obvious In an unexpected way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Another type of humor would be physical humor. Okay, right. (laughs) So this is where we go all the way back to, you know, Charlie Chaplin, Laurel and Hardy, people who who were able to create humor with their bodies on silent films, Mm -hmm. even. And it connects with one of the truths of humor that underlies all these types And that is that humor is a benign tragedy, Hmm. right? So if I uh, trip and fall down the stairs and I'm fine and I get up, oh, (laughs) right? That that might be funny to see. Yeah. If I trip and fall down the stairs, break my neck, and am paralyzed for the rest of my life, that's not funny. Not funny. So there has to be the, the tragedy part and the benign part that, kind of mesh together. So some people are better at this physical humor than others. Some actors, you know, we might think of Jim Carrey as being able to do things with his body that would be tragic if we had to do them. (laughs) But he's okay, so it's funny. One um, One of my grandchildren, when she was young, very young, 
would come and visit. She was actually older than my youngest child. Okay. They were within 10 months of each other. <laughs> so she would come over to our house often and eat dinner, and she would just not eat the vegetables, right? I mean, she would stir around her carrots and just not ever eat one and procrastinate and stir and move them all on the plate and then complain. And you, Well, you know how kids can do this. Yes, a girl after my own heart. <laughs> yeah, she, she wasn't as crafty as my son, who I discovered years later when we moved out of the house that he had managed to get the broccoli in between the cushion oh, and dear. the wooden seat of the chair without me ever knowing. But <laughs> So one night, it just kind of in desperation, I just said, Kaya, if you ate all of those carrots... I would be so shocked, I would fall off my chair. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, well, <laughs> that's all it took. She started eating those carrots like crazy. She had them all eaten in about 12 seconds. And then she looked at me and go, Poppy, I ate all my carrots. Okay, so now what do I have to do? Fall off your chair. I have to fall off the chair. And I have to have a balance between falling off the chair and making it look real enough to pass her <laughs> critical eye and not hurting myself, right. you know, at the age of 40-something. <laughs> and so it, it was a terrible mistake because then every time she came over to our house, she's like, Poppy, if I eat all my whatever, are you going to fall off your chair? Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the videos that I made years ago, I, I had uh, the sea wasp, and uh, it's a neuro toxin that paralyzes its victim. And so in the process of using this source text, I would become paralyzed and fall on the table right in front of someone. Everybody <laughs> always laugh at that. You know, why? You know, yeah. Well, it's it would be a tragedy, only it's benign. Well, it's also pretty unexpected. And to unexpected, too. There you go. Okay, so then the next two could really be kind of combined into one. Okay. Because they're the opposites, right? So one would be hyperbole. Hmm. And the opposite would be exaggeration or understatement. Exaggeration is very often used. One of young people's favorite poets, modern poets, is Jack Prelutsky, who right. writes his little poem about the child who wouldn't take out the trash. And so it piles up in the kitchen, and it piles up in the house, and it piles up in the, <laughs> the street, and it piles up in the city. And finally, the whole world is filled with trash because this child won't do <laughs> their chores. Or the one, Rebecca, who slammed doors and... Perished miserably. Perished. Well, yeah. <laughs> Although that could realistically happen, right? <laughs> if you had a, a great bust of Abraham or Moses sitting above the door and in an old house and you slam the door, it could possibly fall down and kill you. <laughs> that would not be humorous. No. But it is. <laughs> because it's absurd. Well, and we don't know Rebecca. No, we don't know Rebecca. Yeah. And we assume it's fiction. Yes. Jack Proletsky's poem, Kids Love. Oh, oh, homework, I homework, I hate you, you stink. I wish I could wash you right down the sink. Oh, homework, oh, homework, you're giving me fits. If I had a bomb, I would blow you to bits. Yes. Ah, yes. Exaggeration. One of the things that uh, I use in the teacher training and, and parent training is to point out that there's this spectrum of aptitude between mm -hmm. kids and their writing. And on one end of the spectrum, you have the... You know, the child who could write 18 pages nonstop. And then on the other end, you have the child, often a boy, who would rather scrub all the toilets in the building twice than have to write an entire paragraph on paper. I used to think that was an example of hyperbole, but I've met many people say, no, that That's... actually described my child very well. <laughs> right, right. Sometimes I'm teaching a class and and I've kind of established a little rapport with the kids, and, and people come in a little bit late. Mm -hmm. I'll say something like, oh, great, more victims. I, I mean, right. students. You exactly. know, that hyperbole can do that. And then understatement would be kind of this, you know, that is a thing that can really ruin your day, like heat-seeking missiles. <laughs> Right. That would that would ruin our day. <laughs> yes. So making the comparison of the two, mm -hmm. you know, if at first you don't succeed, 
skydiving is not for you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, and a lot of times you'll meet someone who can say things that are very funny, but in this deadpan way. Yes. I wouldn't say that's one of my strong points, humor-wise, but I know a couple people mm -hmm. who can just say something that's flat out ridiculously funny mm -hmm. as if it were not funny at all, mm -hmm. and it amplifies it because mm -hmm. of that that understatement element well, there. Well, as long as you understand that they're actually saying something funny and you don't think that they're not. Well, or the circumstances are that it is funny even though it w really happened or it was mm -hmm. something that wouldn't necessarily be funny in other circumstances. Right. I'm guilty of breaking the number one rule that comedians should follow, which is don't laugh at your own jokes. Right? Yes. But I actually think my jokes are so <laughs> funny that I sometimes do laugh at them. So now we're on six. And this would be the most common we see, which is just your play on words, your pun, mm -hmm. your double entendre. Mm -hmm. And so many languages have the opportunity to do this. In English, we may be particularly rich just because we have so many word origins all competing with each other. Right. The, the, this is definitely a source universally mm -hmm. of humor. And I, I'm not quite sure why. I don't see quite how it's a tragedy, but it does always give you a tickle. Yes. For example, on the bill from the electric company, it says, we will be delighted if you pay your bill on time. If you don't, you will be. Right. Delighted. Like delighted, yes. 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 The sign in the optometrist's office, if you don't see what you're looking for, you've come to the right place. <laughs> right. <laughs> or that joke I told last week, the egg crossing the road, <laughs> having the inclination, yes. right? So it has to. Children love these kinds of jokes. Mm -hmm. I, I guess it helps them understand their language better. Mm. I mean, what little kid has not laughed at, why did the boy throw the clock out the window to see time fly? You're getting that. I remember living in Japan and studying the Japanese language and learning a very sophisticated double entendre in Japanese. Okay. And I managed to learn this well enough to tell a joke that people were amazed I could tell this joke. It had to do with the fact that koi is a fish, right, the carp, mm -hmm. but it also is the Japanese word for love. Okay. The word hakaru is the word for put on a shoe, Okay. right? It's also the word for last or, or stick around for a long time. Right, so we have these, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So the joke is something about the fish swimming into the the shoe that was in the bottom of the river, but it couldn't stay. Koi wa hakanai, because love doesn't last forever. Oh. And yep. this was a great way for me to learn the subtleties mm -hmm. of the language. So I recommend for second language learners try to get a joke book and understand mm -hmm. these things, and that's how you can pick up some of the nuance of these plays on words that are mm -hmm. going to be so tricky. One one of my favorites is the, the guys painting the church. Well, there's these two painters, and they're painting the church, but in, inside the church, but they're running out of paint. Okay. And they don't want to go get more, so they just pour, you know, some thinner into the paint, and then they keep painting. But the pastor of the church is watching this from the from the upper window in the story, and he sees what's going on. Mm -hmm. So he goes over to the sound booth, and he oh. picks up the microphone and turns on the volume, and he says, "Repaint, repaint, <laughs> and thin no more." <laughs> no more. That's very good. I have not heard that one before. <laughs> no, I got some old jokes on my list yes. here. <laughs> okay, now we're into. Number seven, mm -hmm. which would be irony. Okay, good now, one. irony is very, very hard mm. to explain. It's hard to create. It's important to see. The best definition I found was when you have to hold two opposing concepts at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it creates kind of a cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. And... 
that dissonance is what creates the tension that creates the humor. Okay. Mark Twain was probably the modern master of irony. He said things like, quitting smoking is easy. I have done it hundreds of times. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So that's kind of got a double entendre mm -hmm. <laughs> element to it. Probably a better example of irony would be there's a little scene in uh, Tom Sawyer where Tom says to Huck, Finn, he says, now, Huck, if you'll just go back to the widow and be respectable, you can join my band of robbers. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that dissonance between be respectable and be a robber, mm -hmm. we, we wouldn't put those together. No. And then probably the absolute best example I have ever seen of irony was a picture on Facebook or on a website or something. I think this may be the best thing I've ever seen on the internet in terms of humor, but imagine a wooden fence, solid wooden fence, mm -hmm. with red spray paint, mm -hmm. right? And at the top it says, things I hate, colon, underline. Then it says, one, vandalism. <laughs> right. Two, irony. <laughs> three, can you guess three? Lists. <laughs> so it just it goes that one extra little step. So that's a beautiful one. And irony is a well regarded literary technique and you know, people have written doctoral dissertations mm. on whether Plato mm. certain things he said in the Republic or maybe the entire Republic was to be understood ironically. Mm -hmm. So when you kind of say one thing but you mean another, or there's a, a dissonance between those two. Then we would get to number eight, is that right? Which would be either, you could call it common sense or slash the painful truth. Yes. Right? One of my early experiences in teaching the Structure and Style program, mm -hmm. I was out doing a class for kids and I was teaching prepositional sentence openers. Okay. Great. Right? And so when I do this, I usually say, does anyone know any prepositions? You know, and one kid will raise a hand and say, in, and another will go out, and then one will go up, and another will go down, and then, you know, another one will say the, of course, you know, <laughs> no. And then uh -huh. occasionally you'll get someone who will raise their hand and start spitting them out, about above according to after long you can submit a month, right? And they'll spit them all out. So I had this one little girl, first time this ever happened to me, she's probably 13, and she's spitting them all out, and I'm writing them on the board, and I finally get down to the, like, the end of the board, and she's still on the Bs or something. And I say, so how many prepositions do you know? All of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then usually for the rest of the people who don't know all of them, I can hand out a list. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she was sweet. She came up to me after the class. She goes, oh, Mr. Puto, I'm so grateful I came to your class. I said, well, why is that? And she said, because, you know, my mom made me memorize all those prepositions, but I've never known what to do with them. <laughs> right. <laughs> So kind of a, you know, a painful truth, right. like a common sense thing. We, we may make kids do something, and then they finally realize the use of it. Right. And maybe not to that point. Churchill made this statement. He said, some men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most simply pick themselves up and continue on as if nothing had happened. Yes, <laughs> and isn't that? It's true for all of us, yes, you know, when we true. see, when we hear or see a truth that isn't convenient, mm -hmm. uh, we just continue on, right? Mark Twain, I think, said the best, the best one, he said something like, it isn't the things in the Bible which I don't understand that bother me. It's the things that are perfectly clear that cause me concern. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> isn't that true for all mm -hmm. of us? So mm -hmm. there's that kind of common sense and painful truth that we can all experience very personally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then uh, we get to probably the one that we all grew up with was jokes of derogation. Okay. Or they're kind of a form of hyperbole because it's a caricature. Mm -hmm. Some are, you know, very common, blonde jokes. Right. The irony about blonde jokes is that blondes know more blonde jokes than anyone else. Just like lawyers know more lawyer jokes than anyone else. And the only one who knows any engineer jokes would be an engineer. <laughs> but it's always very dangerous to tell jokes of derogation 
or caricature. Hmm. I mean, I personally have gotten in、mm-hmm. trouble because I thought my audience was safe, or I was making a recording, and then down the line, someone heard it and thought, "Oh, what a、yes. horrible thing! My poor child is blonde," and you know. So, <laughs> you you have to be very careful. People don't seem to have a problem picking on lawyers, <laughs> you know, because even the lawyers will pick on each other.、Mm-hmm. Why don't sharks eat lawyers? Professional courtesy. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Do you realize it was so cold outside? The lawyers had their hands in their own pockets. <laughs> yeah. I was, of course, in an orchestra, so there's、mm-hmm. viola jokes, saxophone jokes.、Mm-hmm. What's the definition of perfect pitch? <laughs> a saxophone in the dumpster from twenty feet, or what's the difference between a viola and an onion? No one cares when you chop up a viola.、Right? Oh. Okay, <laughs> but honestly, the very best type of derogation, and the only really acceptable type, is self derogation. Right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When you you acknowledge something about yourself, and then you admit the truth. And people can can relate to that.、Mm-hmm. Thomas Mann said, who was a famous writer, he said, "Writers are people for whom writing is more difficult than other people." <laughs> that's a that's a painful truth、right. combined with the self derogation. <laughs> you could say that same thing. <laughs> Probably. Then, if we're on number ten, disaster imagery:、oh. pie in the face, the slapstick,、right. the falling down the stairs, the. Kind of the physical humor. I, I just don't really get that anymore. I don't know if we've evolved in the last hundred <laughs> years. Our sense of humor has developed, and we no longer <laughs> think that funny. But I really don't think that if someone walked in here and stuck a pie in your face, <laughs> I don't think I would laugh. I'd, actually, I'd think about the added time and expense of cleaning up the mess, probably. But. The last one, of course, is is grossness,、hmm. and、um, you know, rightly so. We have to be careful with grossness because it can border on the crude、mm-hmm. to the disgusting to the、mm-hmm. unacceptable. Right. But there are certain things that have a disgust to them. Only there's an innocence. There's that again, the benign. So I had a charming experience years and years ago. One of my daughters was just starting to use email,、hmm. and I was traveling quite a bit, and she and I were very close, and she was just starting to really get fluent with her writing and. She always had kind of a unusual way of seeing things and expressing ideas. Very unique, very creative、mm-hmm. kid. And one day, I received this in my email inbox. Okay. And I'll finish up with this because this is, I think, the perfect example of this done well. Okay. Better than I ever could. Daddy, hurrah! Your message finally reached. Let's hope that we'll always be able to contact through email. I think the problem was that I hadn't checked my screen for a very long time. I think it'll be good though if I type more often, because I'll be doing a science class online, and I will need to be able to whiz out words. Well, I think that you'll be happy because I'm cleaning my room today, but you'll never guess what happened in the process. I was organizing my desk. When I spied a gigantic fly, I was rather annoyed because when I tried to get the fly out of my room, it simply wouldn't. So I smacked it to half deadness on my window. After I had scooped it up on a piece of paper, I tried to squeeze out its guts while discovering its sex. Evidently, you can do this by squeezing a fly, determine if it's male or female. <laughs> That's the science class. That's the science class.、Um, <laughs> instead of the answer easily sliding out, the desperate creature tried to walk away.、Oh, dear. At that, I removed his legs by force of pencil pressure, <laughs>、oh, no. then drowned it with saliva. 
<laughs> this was too much for the pitiful fly. It was realizing how merciless this human torturer was. With the last loving look ever to be made by this guilty innocent, it secured the thought of sureness as it realized the glorious fact that the tiny maggoty descendants were all safely on their way to a lifelong avenge. All that will survive on our property anyway. Now, how's that for grossness? <laughs> Fortunately, it's folding clothes that demands me elsewhere, so I'll have to say bye and sorry for the delay of my next dramatizing experiences, <laughs> all of which I will happily share with you. I'll be back. <laughs> with love oozing out of this message, your growing daughter, Fiona. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> so that's one of those priceless things that you treasure as a... Right. <laughs> father whose children are all grown up now and couldn't write something like that if they tried probably <laughs> no. but only a child right right so it is possible to hone your skills become becoming more funny becoming more engaging so that you can be a good teacher a better parent perhaps and Overall, just a better person if we laugh more and learn how to make others laugh. Well, and I would finish up with this quote from one of the great humorists of my generation, Garrison Keillor. Yes. He said, jokes are democratic. Telling one right has nothing to do with having money or being educated. It's a knack, like hammering a nail straight. Anyone can learn it, and it's useful in all sorts of situations. You can go your whole life and not need trigonometry or physics for a minute. But the ability to tell a joke is always handy. Indeed. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes or Stitcher, or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcast. Until then, on behalf of Andrew Poudois and the team at IEW, I thank you for the privilege of allowing us to partner with you on this educational journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking.